Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact or donate. In this episode, we have a conversation with Roy Moran. Roy is the founder of Shoal Creek Community Church, the author of Spent Matches, and the chairman of the board at New Generations. In this episode, we discuss disciple-making movements and the mind shifts and heart changes that DMM brings about in the culture of our lives and the lives that we impact. I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Roy has a lot of incredible things to say. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and here's the conversation. Roy Moran, well, welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Joshua. I appreciate you having me, man. I'm excited about this whole podcast thing you're doing. <laughs> yeah, it's been really fun. I've uh, had really good conversations with some people now. I've really enjoyed it. So um, it's uh, helping people go a little bit deeper than surface level, uh, uh, especially in the relationship with Jesus. So, so how did you come up with the name? Uh, I've always been fascinated with with uh, a transfer of culture towards mm -hmm. more kingdom culture of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to figure out what's a, you know, one step that we can do to to make sure that cultures can tra uh, transform from within. So mm -hmm. uh, when Meredith and I went to the Middle East, uh, our mission statement of what we wanted to do was we dream that within our lifetime movements of Muslims following Jesus would sweep across the Arab world and transform it from within. Um, and so one of the things that I've always said is that we wanted to help local people take what they have learned and their culture and go deep, especially into the, the roots and the worldview level and help a long lasting transformation from within. So been fascinating with that for a long time. And then, yeah, so shifting culture is what I landed on. Well, that's cool. I, I love that idea because one of the things that hit me when I, I heard the, the title was, um, I think for the first five years I was involved in the, the whole disciple making movements tactic. I, I really uh, began to, uh, well, I first start, thought it was just a training issue. Hmm. You know, it was yeah. just about, I could just take into a local church. I could just retrain people. They've been trained how to share their faith. Now they need to change, you know, just change their way they they do things and learn how to just share their story invite people into discovery yep. read the bible together people would would come to faith through that and um and i realized it was really not about training it was about culture uh, mm. you literally you know as a if you're in an organization that's attempting to move from a different strategy you know yep. say a, an addition type strategy to a multiplication type strategy it's literally a cultural issue, not yeah. not a, a training issue. So yeah. I love your title. Yeah, thanks. And, and I think, you know, when a long time ago, just as, you know, my dad wrote a book called uh, about biblical worldview integration. He started a Christian school. And so he talked a lot about worldview and talked about how how your worldview affects your your value system and your values mm -hmm you know, affect the, the behavior and all those mm -hmm. behaviors then affect the culture around. And so you had to go back to the root system, what's underneath uh, to be able to change the fruit of what you see uh, around you. Um, and so that's good. Have you seen that happen? Have you seen a culture shift happen to a culture of disciple making towards and that revolves around Jesus um, yeah, anywhere around the world and how did they get there? Yeah, I think in, um, uh, in, in the, the world of movements that, that I get a chance to in, be involved in, um, say like in East Africa, I think there's a, a, a definite shift taking place you know, does it move the needle uh, on terms of lostness and, and that kind of stuff? Not yet, I don't think, but it does move the needle in terms of um, watching heaven come to earth, you know, mm. this whole yeah. kingdom value. Yeah. Um, so watching uh, the lives of women um, 
and and what they go through on a daily basis change as a result of being valued as human beings and Mm -hmm. and being seen as image bearers watching children um especially female children and and watching them be valued as image bearers and and no longer um having to put up with what they have to put up with in some cultures um you know, watching uh, people began to uh, reach out to their neighbors, even, uh, you know, extremely, extremely poor people from a Western standpoint, watching yep. them uh, develop hearts of generosity uh, with what little they have and and began to reach out to neighbors and share um, and, and help feed their neighbors and help you know, heal their neighbors and those kinds of things, you know, watching that happen, you begin to realize that, that something's happening from the inside out here yep. uh, with these people, because the culture they grew up in really drove them one way, but mm-hmm. the, the new culture, the new kingdom DNA that's being planted inside them yep. is, is causing them to choose against themselves and, and live an other centered life. Yeah. And I, you know, as we, we come to realize our own identity as beloved sons or daughters of the father, um, that we can see others as the same, that they are also mm-hmm. beloved and they are image bearers, right? You could see them with oh, yeah. the father's eyes and it, yeah. it does something totally different that we could start to become more like Jesus and hang out with uh, with the prostitutes and the tax collectors and everybody else that Jesus hung out with, um, because oh, yeah. we yeah. see them with it, with new eyes and fresh eyes. Yeah, you know the, the the concept of of kingdom as a culture, you know, and the idea of Jesus being the king. Um, it, it sometimes in the, the neighborhoods that you and I live in, because we mm-hmm. we live here in you know Midwest and stuff. Um, and you ask people, would you like your, uh, where you live to be less like hell and more like heaven? Um, and, and people look around and they see well-fed, r- really overfed, uh, yep. people. The yep. only, the only complaints they have is they don't mow the yard or they, you know, this, <laughs> the, the level of comfort, at, which yeah. we live at is, is, is so high, um, that it's so hard for us in the West, you know, to, to really see what it would look like, but you know, is it, when you get behind the curtain or, or you look at it as a different filter, you look up and down these, you know, well manicured neighborhoods and houses and you see a poverty in marriage. Mm-hmm. You know, we see now um, COVID is exposing, it didn't cause, but exposed a poverty of, of relationship. Yep. And we see that people have so few spaces, uh, you know, where they're known and explored and discovered. Yeah, uh, and, and they, they're just living a, a, a life of isolation. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, even in relationship to the people they live in, you know, they're living in a, in a house where there's duets, you know, kind of lived out in monologues mm. because they don't even connect, you yeah. know, and that kind of stuff. And so the poverty that exists and the need to bring, you know, kingdom values, you know, into in that kind of poverty is, is necessary, even in the West, you know, yeah. that, that um, and sometimes, you know, those of us who've grown up in kind of traditional Christianity, which which ha- has a lot of flaws in it, you know, it, it mm-hmm. causes us to become blind yeah. you know, to those kinds of poverty that exist in our culture. Yeah, I think it, we probably have to have a redefinition of poverty. Um, so what mm-hmm. what would you tell somebody that poverty is? Um, and it's probably not monetary. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I do think it's, it goes back to your original thought about kingdom values. You know, it's poverty is a lack of, of, uh, of what's happening in heaven. Mm-hmm. You know, when Jesus prays or teaches us to pray, you know, may it be on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. This idea of, of kingdom values, the, the life, the, the everlasting kingdom that, that uh, those who are connected to Jesus will live in, um, so those values, you know, getting a chance to be experienced on earth, you know, yeah. in a space where, you know, I don't think there is a, um, a mental health issue in heaven, you know, right. heaven is a place where I get known and explored yeah. and discovered and, yeah. and I feel loved at a, at a really deep level. Um, mm. and there's not a sense of isolation in heaven, Yeah, you know, so 
when I look at that, I, I see poverty as a lack of those kingdom values, you know, in our life right now. Um, and unfortunately, especially for those of us in the West, poverty is usually related to money. You know, I lack money, right. so therefore I can't afford, you know, water, health, sanitation, you know, food, those kinds of things. And it's it's so much more than that. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, that's really good. The the lack of heaven on earth is uh, is a really good definition of poverty. I like that mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, is there a good way for us to posture ourselves uh, to bring heaven to earth to those around us and to the community around us? Well, you know, I'm um, a real proponent of a disciple making movements a mindset and lifestyle, you know, to help people understand that um, the, the kind of Christianity that's been um, prosecuted in the West, you know, is, is all really has its center of gravity on Sunday. It's focused on a building, usually focused mm -hmm. on large gatherings. It's usually focused on, on gatherings where there's a very few people that, that, that use gifts and most people are consumers Yep. And there's only a few producers in that, that kind of thing. And, and it's moving the center of gravity of our Christianity from, from that Sunday to Sunday thing to a uh, 24 seven space where we put our feet on the ground when we get out of bed in the morning, yeah. you know, it's where we spend our time. And that, that's where we see our core spirituality, you know, being lived out. And it's there that those kingdom values can, can leak down and to bring, you know, heaven to earth in that sense. And so I love, you know, the, the use of, uh, of discovery Bible study, helping people understand, you know, that their job as a follower of Jesus, their, their first foremost and final job as a follower of Jesus is to make disciples. That was yep. Jesus's last command to us. Um, I can't imagine on that day when it's all over, <laughs> you're, you know, you're coming to the finish line and Jesus is there looking and he's looking and he's looking and, and he's, he's looking for you, but he's looking for the people you're bringing, you know, yeah. because he said, make disciples and, and you show up, you know, by yourself. And it's like, he's like, where is everybody? You know, it's like, <laughs> I just, I ask you to make disciples and you know, I ask you to, you know, teach people to, you know, obey, you know, to, to learn right. obedience to everything I've commanded. That's, that's all I ask, <laughs> you know, and, you know, we did this and that and that and that, and that but, but we didn't do the very basic thing mm -hmm. that he, he said. So, you know, we just teach people to, to uh, learn to read the Bible for themselves, get their fingerprints in the Bible and then invite their friends and neighbors and relatives into that process. Yep. Uh, and so uh, learning that process of, of being able to, as a, uh, an ordinary, you know, follower of Jesus to hear from God and to do what he says yeah. and share it with someone, you know, is to me, it's, it's like the, the basic, uh, I have these, uh, um, Lego blocks on my desk here to remind uh -huh. me that, that, um, uh, you know, I don't know if you've, you've probably seen some of the Lego shows and stuff and some yeah. of the spaces around this world where people build, you know, crazy things Incredible out of Legos, things. but, <laughs> but, but they're just this simple, simple pieces yeah, and out of simple block. things. Yeah. Yeah. Big things can be built. And yep. uh, so, you know, out of that simple process of, of hearing from God, doing what he says and sharing it with other people, you know, amazing kingdom values, you know, can be built inside people. Yeah, that's good to take it back to the simple basics. What does it look like to follow Jesus and then to reproduce it in others to help others be disciples? Uh, mm -hmm. Then, you know, something that on the outside looks like it just looks beautiful, complex, uh, you know, different colors. But the building blocks are the exact same all the way throughout mm -hmm. the whole the whole process. And I love, mm -hmm. I, you know, I love that analogy i heard it said before that you know god likes fractal multiplication um and you mm -hmm. know it's just like fractals simple fractals mm -hmm. that then mm -hmm. flow out and get multiplied um you know yeah. but i really like your analogy it's really good and helpful what's you know something as you're you're in this world of of disciple making movements you're seeing one of the things that was a a shift in my mind the first thing, when I got really excited about disciple-making movements, I was excited about the rapid 
multiplication aspect of it. Like it mm -hmm. can just flow easily. And my and I came to realize that to get rapid multiplication, it takes long term walking with people, pointing them to Jesus mm -hmm. on the every day. And it's a messy, messy process when you're in the middle of it. So mm -hmm. how do you how do you take people from, you know, what's on the surface? What does it look like from the outside to what does it really look like on the inside? Well, one of the stories I like to tell um, is um, a lot of people have get their start by reading the book Miraculous Movements. Mm -hmm. And um, or Jerry Matthews. Trousdale's are, no. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> May, maybe, but mo mostly Miraculous <laughs> Movements. Huh? But uh, J Jerry Trousdale is a dear friend, and, um, and, and I'm always teasing him about the fact that he really wrote part two. Mm. He didn't, yep. he didn't write part one mm -hmm. and part one of that sub-Saharan story. Um, and I, you know, I, I have the privilege of, of working regularly and knowing those, all those guys um, is, is messy. I mean, you started yeah. in 2003, you go to about 2008 and it's just a windy path. It's, yep. <laughs> it's convoluted. It's there's restarts. There's, you know, people that come in and go out and, and it, it just, it's just messy and ugly, yeah. you know, in some, some spots. And then because of the perseverance yep. that takes place and because of, uh, there are a handful of guys who just said, we're, we're, we're going to see, um, what God can do. And we're going to, we're not going to take failure as, as anything other than a learning experience. Yeah. And as a result of that, you know, the book starts in 2008 and, and begins to really, you know, show the, the whole story. But if you read, you know, the, uh, the prequel to miraculous movements, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Westerners wouldn't even get started uh, Oh yeah, because of what you just said, yeah. you know, it's just messy in that sense. And so I think of it in terms of um, just, you know, mindset shifts for me, I came to a, you know, I'm leading a successful church, um, we're seeing people come to faith. We're baptizing them. Yeah. Um, you know, all, all of the, all of the ways that we count success in the West, uh, at when I was, you know, involved, uh, or I still am involved show Creek, um, was, were really good. But at the same time, I was looking at the County that I lived in here in Clay County, which mm -hmm. is in Northeast Kansas city. And, and I could see that even with our success, uh, we weren't moving the needle on lostness. My right. county was still, there were still more people dying and going to hell in my county um, after I started Shoal Creek than mm -hmm. before I started Shoal Creek. Um, now, mm -hmm. there are a lot of anecdotal stories, hundreds of people come to faith and, right. you know, that right. kind of stuff. But uh, I had to realize that I really wanted to affect the county I, I had, I, I wanted to see these 300,000 people that God had laid on our heart and stuff. So there was a, um, there was a real sense in which I, I had to change my mind about how things came. And, and that drove me to, you know, not looking for the latest, uh, DVD or book that was out right. by the, the, the popular author, you know, and stuff. I just started on a, a trek to see, you know, where, where is true multiplication taking place? Mm -hmm. You know, where, you know, if you, you read, you know, or you get involved in Silicon Valley in any way, form or fashion, the word scale is a big deal. Right. You know, it's like, yep. will this scale, will this scale? I mean, will it not go from, you know, one to two, but will it go from one to a hundred, you mm -hmm. know, will it, will it do a hundred times or a thousand times or 10,000 times? And, and I just started asking the question, I said, you know, the gospel should scale. Yeah you know, it, it, it should somehow scale. And so I just began a, a worldwide search. I started in, in the U S but, you know, ended up in the world to find a place like that. And then as I did, I discovered that those values drove me back to the text of scripture yep. and, and drove me back to um, sort of a basic understanding that I failed to get, even though I have, you know, I'm, I'm pretty educated as, as, as it theological terms <laughs> yeah. go, you know, I, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm educated beyond my own intelligence, you know? Um, so 
those they drove those values deep, you know, in me and and in such a way that instead of it being the newest fad or thing, you know, I've been at this for almost 13 years now, you know, right. in a sense and people say, well, you know, aren't you going to give up? There aren't movements in the West yet. You know, I blah, 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 all kind of stuff. It's like, well, I find myself uh, finding it hard to give up because it's not uh, a new fad or anything. It's just, it's what I see in the text of scripture mm-hmm. and that, that has rooted my mindset, you know, in, in biblical values. Yeah. And so I, I see the, you know, the scriptures in a different way. Now, when I read, you know, when Jesus heals the demoniac and he tries to get in the boat with Jesus and Jesus says, no, go back to where you came from and tell him what I did. Well, my modus operandi before that was basically to say, okay, let's get this guy into a follow-up class. Let's get him, yeah. you know, through the 12 fundamentals and, and let's see if we can train him to be a small group leader and get him equipped with the skills and mindsets that he needs, you know, yeah. and, and, and let's get him, you know, maybe in three years into leadership. Yeah. And Jesus says, no, go now. <laughs> <laughs> and those kinds of moments, as I reread the scriptures, just yeah. turned me upside down. You know, wow. it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I began to see a, a different way of, of understanding what Jesus was doing. And so now, um, you know, e- even though I, I really cringe, you know, um, the, the idea of, of DMM or disciple making movements and that kind of stuff gets thrown around so much and people yeah. look at it like it's, they can go buy it at a Christian bookstore if right. those existed anymore. Um, <laughs> but but it, it really is uh, a, a deep set biblical uh, worldview yeah. uh, that has, has set in me and in such a way that I'm willing to live the rest of my life, whatever I've got left, you know, trying to figure yeah. out how do I help people get this kind of kingdom value embedded, you know, in their life um, and stuff. So I'm, I'm not sure if I'm even answering your question here, Joshua. <laughs> I think that's good, but I, I also think, it, you know, if we're changing our mindset, we have to be humble enough to, to say, we don't, we don't actually know everything. <laughs> and oh, yeah. there, yeah. there is something that we need to learn that we need to learn from scripture. I also think, you know, you're saying, where does is multiplication happening? We might have to go out and we might have to learn from our African brothers and sisters. Um, mm-hmm. And we have to sit under their teaching. Um, mm-hmm. And that's a that's a humble thing for for a Westerner <laughs> to mm-hmm. do. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it's important. And what what have you learned from your African brothers and sisters in this multiplication arena? Well, one of the, the first things that they taught me was how to accept failure. Growing up as a Westerner um, w- with a, a real ethnocentrism yeah. about myself, you know, I mean, so, some people might call that racism, but, it, you know, I, I like to think of it as we're all ethnocentric, right. you know, we all have this, we start from ourselves, we are our own standard, yep. we're what's normal. And everything else is abnormal, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, when you, as you know, this and traveling overseas and, you know, especially in Africa, um, things there don't always work. Mm. Um, so, <laughs> you know, the roads you travel on, uh, we, we take a small spare in our car because we might have a flat, mm-hmm. you know, once a year, maybe, well, they take two spares because they're, they're going to have a flat, um, <laughs> for sure on this trip and, and probably two and hopefully not three, you know, that kind of thing. And so their, their way of looking at the world was, is, is it doesn't work. Yeah. My way of looking at the world was, is it works. Mm. And so I I realized that I had an entitlement piece, you know, I come back to the Bible and I say, you know, God says there's a God of this world and he, he's not my God, you know, (laughs) he's a different God. And so this, this world doesn't work. Wow. And they were closer to the text of scripture than I was. Yeah. And I had to come back and realize is that some of my really basic filters in life are, are based off of sort of an Americanism, mm-hmm. not a, a biblicalism, you know, in that sense. Wow. Um, and so they, they helped me, you know, to just learn patience and learn that when things don't work, you, you don't give up. You, you yeah. just keep moving. 
Yeah. And, and, and failure is just, you know, we, we like to use the you know, failures, the first step to success and all those kinds of things are great posters <laughs> and, and they're great, you know, screen savers and all that kind of stuff, but we don't really believe them. Right. You know, we don't really <laughs> don't. live by them, but they yeah. live, they live by them. It is a part of the texture of their life. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I've, I've watched, in fact, I just got off of, um, you know, zoom with a, a, one of the best movement leaders that I know. And, um, I I've watched a guy who's got like, he's been to like six seminaries. He's got as much Western education as, as anybody I know, but he, he is the most catalytic leader in, in the sense that when he's in the room, yeah. sometimes you don't know he's in the room. Hmm. Um, he, he has the ability to raise up people and, wow. and, and create leaders around him without sucking all the air in the room out. Hmm. And I, I was trained in a way that, um, that taught me to be attractive. You yeah. know, I need to use my knowledge my persuasive skills, my leadership, uh, mm -hmm. all of my abilities to attract people to me, to shine brightly so that they would follow me and, and, yeah. and have allegiance and loyalty to me. And I watched uh, an African leader who had a radically polar opposite way of operating mm. who had more influence mm. um than than i could ever imagine and he was operating in, in in the opposite direction i was and so i i learned or i've, I've begun learning that humility you know wow. how to keep yeah. my mouth shut how to ask <laughs> questions rather yeah. than to give answers you yep. know um, how to give people how to back away and give people opportunity Yep. You know, rather than using, you know, take initiative and have a bias for action mm. and all those kinds of things that I always thought were really great leadership qualities. Yeah. Um, and so they, they just model those for me and they're wow. very patient yeah. um, ab about, you know, letting me <laughs> see those things rather than pointing them out to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's an amazing quality is that patience towards you. Um, and I think, you know, mm -hmm. letting you discover, um, yeah. what you don't know, um, it's yeah. going to have more impact on you in the long term. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny how they, they have adopt, adapted Western things to explain that to me, you know, in a sense. <laughs> so, um, uh, the word catalyst is not necessarily, um, it, it's a, it's an English word yeah. and it's not necessarily found uh, that readily in other languages and stuff. Um, but I I've seen in movement world, it's been adopted in right. a big way. Uh -huh. and, and so they pointed out to me that, that, um, like, uh, an epoxy has a catalyst and, and a hardener in it, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so kind of a glue base and then, then this catalyst piece and the, and the catalyst piece disappears. You know, when you squeeze it out of a tube and say there's two tubes and it goes yeah. down and you mix it together, the, the catalyst piece of it just disappears. Huh. And and they pointed out to me that, you know, that that's the kind of leadership we're looking for is a, the kind of leadership that fades away, you know, and it's like, oh, OK, I got it now. <laughs> but but it, that is polar opposite to anything and everything that I ever learned about leadership in a formal setting. Yeah, it is. It is. So how does yeah. that work in, in like, I don't know, three, four five generations down the, down the line when you have a Catholic leadership that disappears, what kind of leaders remain? Well, I mean, that, that's the kind of leader that remains, I think, um, yeah. you know, what, what happens is, is, is that your role ends up being coaching mm -hmm. rather, rather than performing. And so from behind, you're, you're able to work with people yep. and, and help coach them re rather than uh, have them follow you in your performance or whatever you're doing. And so you model a little bit for them and then you give them, you know, opportunities and then you coach them from, you know, from the shadows. Yeah. And, and so, you know, my friend, Harry Brown at new generations is, is fond of always saying that you're not in the movement business you know, un unless you can give it away, you can give yep. the gospel away to the third generation. And it happens at the same quality as when you're present. Yeah. So, you know, at that point, you know, when your great grandchildren are, are, are 
having the kind of kingdom values that you started with that that you're you've been able to give it away and it's been able to give it away again and yeah. you've got the kind of quality that will remain and i think that is at that point you've got a leadership and you've also modeled that coaching you know yeah. a lot of people think in terms of the movement world they think it's just like a match thrown into a forest fire and it just burns it down and yeah and the, the fact is is that you know every Every one of the movements that Justin Long is tracking at 2414, you know, yep. has a, a deep coaching element to it. Yeah, you know, it I know you, you know that and you guys at, at All Nations are, you know, invested in that. You know, all, all of us in movements are invested in this idea of having, you know, a, a long term coaching relation. In fact, yeah. someone asked yesterday at the the DMM global catalyst camp, when do you stop coaching? And it's like, the answer was when you stop breathing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. That coaching is, I mean, that's a different mindset too. You know, when, when Meredith and I went out to the middle East, when we first went to find open and hungry uh, people for the gospel, we found Muslims that were open to Jesus. Uh, we, we gathered more people in a room and modeled a discovery Bible study with them. And we very quickly tried to extract ourselves out, um, mm -hmm. but it never worked, not once. Um, the only time it worked is when we changed strategies. We found open and hungry people for the gospel. These Muslims said, yes, I want to follow Jesus. And so we did it individually with them or their fa immediate family and modeled a discovery Bible study and said, okay, now you take this and go do this with your friends and your family and your neighbors and everybody around you. And then we, you know, we had a behind the scenes coaching relationship and things started to multiply. They started to step into leadership instead of relying on us to say, hey, you're the spiritual, you know, teacher here, you teach. Um, it was totally transformative for the for us, and we started to see, you know, second, third, fourth generations happen because we took the back seat from the very beginning. And we never took a front seat, not even once, and that was the one thing that really helped us out. Yeah, you know, that's uh, again uh, that that was the sort of revolution in my own mind of, of being hit with that and you read like x19 paul mm -hmm. is is in ephesus and he had some trouble you know in the synagogue and so he stopped sort of public type ministry type stuff um and and he moves down the street you know to a a, a hall a, a basic rinse of space you know and, and starts discussing with the disciples and then quickly luke says you know and as a result of that the entire asia minor heard the word of the lord and it's like well yeah. it didn't say he went on you know crusades or led a bunch of this and that kind of stuff but obviously there's multiplication taking place there because the discussions he's having with the disciples somehow reaches out you know all yeah. to asia minor and yeah. so that idea of <laughs> you and i not being the binding agent Yep. You know, in these things. And that's what happens with so many people and, and especially so many people in the U S who are, you know, think, thinking they're using a, a disciple making movement strategy. Um, and they're doing, um, discovery groups with, you know, immigrant populations mm -hmm. and they're in the middle of it, facilitating these discovery groups. And, you know, it's hard to mm -hmm. tell them that it's selfish, but, yep. but the reality is, you know, it, it's really selfish because you just want to be where the action is. <laughs> and, and the reality is if you want the gospel to multiply, then you got to get out of that room. Yeah. You, know, you, you've got to somehow facilitate someone else being there. Yeah. That's uh, an insider and you're definitely not an insider, you know, <laughs> in that regard. Yeah. That's so good. And it's so needed, especially here in the West as we're trying to, to go out and see, gospel saturation happen throughout you know the united states how do we get out of the way um mm -hmm. but then give everybody the tools that they need to discover uh jesus within mm -hmm. their own community and that could then multiply that's so good yeah yeah uh, as you you've been in this disciple making movement worlds i mean you're you're pretty steeped into it since you had those mind shifts, how has your personal relationship with Jesus 
transformed and changed um, since this has happened? So I used to be a professional Christian, yeah. um, you know, because I'm uh, on the staff of a church. I started a church. I'm, you know, on boards of Christian organizations and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and w- one of the beauties about this whole process, it's, it's driven me back to get my fingerprints on the Bible uh, mm-hmm. in a way that that is not for something. Mm. Uh, um, yeah. so, you know, it, it's usually for, um, right. you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on Sunday morning, exactly. you know, I've got, I've got to, you know, th- do this. It's not for something it, it, it's for me. Mm. Um, and, and to be able to, so, you know, the, the very first thing that happened in this whole process is, is, um, it affected my spiritual disciplines, uh, because I, uh, I, I learned the value of solitude, um, right, right, right off the bat as I began to realize it's like, okay, it's really not about giving answers. It's about asking questions here. And, and, and I don't know how that connected really to me, but I've, I've always been a person who likes a lot of noise, drives my wife crazy. You know, I'll come, I'll come in and I'll turn music on and I'll have, you know, I can have the TV, I can have music going on. I'd be working on my computer at the same time. I got this chaos going on and it's a little bit like a drug for me. I'm a little bit ADHD. And so I need a mm-hmm. lot of, of riddle and like stuff going on in my brain so I can yeah. focus. Um, and, and so I, I didn't allow a lot of space for God to have the agenda. Hmm. And so that solitude and this idea of being far more passive in my leadership um, yeah. and, and, and far more indirect in my leadership, maybe yeah. not passive, but indirect yeah. um, and, and, and learning to, to, uh, not act quickly, but to mm-hmm. set back and, and leave room for other people to act. All of those kinds of things began to drive me to realize that I, I just started discovering the value of solitude mm-hmm. and, and spending 30 minutes alone and just having a, a, a mantra, you know, I'm not, not a new age guy type thing, but just a mantra that says to God, your agenda, not mine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your, your agenda, not mine. Cause my mind's full of things, you know, yep. I got oh, yeah. things pop and I can pull up my phone and, you know, put down a couple of notes here and there and all this kind of stuff. It's like, it's like, no father, your agenda, not mine. You know, I have to keep reminding myself of that. Mm. And, uh, it really just sort of took me down a notch. Maybe, um, some, sometimes I could appear like I'm on, you know, my third espresso <laughs> double shot, you know, and, it took me down a notch to say, wow, there's a calmness that can be here. And mm. there's a, there's a real beauty to that sense of calmness that, 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 that space where you meet uh, mm. Jesus and, and there doesn't have to be a lot of activity, a lot of things. And, and, and it, it was in those spaces that, that I began to, to experience being the beloved, you know, yeah. being that, that child of God and, and realizing that, man, I, I, there's no trophies that I have to take out of this world. You know, yeah, exactly. uh, uh, that, yeah. that old song is all my trophies. I lay down and you know, I think, okay, I don't, I don't have any trophies mm. here. Uh, all I have is the fact that my father decided to count me w- with the most infinite value of, of anything that exists in all the universe. Jesus died for me. Yeah. And, and that value, that price tag he put on me was, was of such great value that that's, that's all I need. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it brought Good. me back to that, yeah. you know, I, I spent a life pursuing books. I spent, you know, life pursuing degrees and, you know, yeah. I have a degree in Greek and study Hebrew and Aramaic and all that kind of stuff, you know, um, and, and a lot of that's good stuff, but but I was doing it for the wrong reasons and yeah. it just took me back to f- some really simple things that, yeah. um, that I'm just a child of God. And, and that's what I want to take out of this world. You know? Yeah. That's so good. Did, did that practice of solitude that get you back into a, a little quieter space affect the relationships around you? Yeah, it, it did. It, it, um, it, it caused me to be more curious. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think, um, this whole idea of, of not being a teller, but being an asker and, and letting other people discover things 
helped me learn to love people better mm-hmm. because I, I began to get, get curious and I, and I, and I'm, I have a love affair with curiosity now. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I collect questions. I love to ask questions and help people learn to ask questions. Cause I look around, you know, earlier we were talking about our, uh, sort of mental health deficit in our world. Yep. And, and people just don't know how to lean into one another and explore each other. Yeah. You know, it's just, we, we, we get the surface stuff down and, and then we get to a space where maybe we, we find that we, we don't see eye to eye politically, or we don't see eye to eye about some, you know, the yep. whatever, you know, and, and we just sort of stay there and we just right. operate there rather than continuing this, this exploration to get, you know, into, you know, who, who is Joshua, what makes him tick yeah. and, and why does he think that way? And that kind of stuff. So it, it helped me just be curious about people, mm. you know, and, and I've discovered that people feel loved when you're curious about them, <laughs> you, know? Very true. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, wow, who, who would have known, you know, yeah. that if you ask more questions and give more answers, you know, people feel loved. And yeah. so yeah. How many, how many direct answers did Jesus give when he was asked questions? Uh, not very many. Yeah. Not very many at all. Yeah. <laughs> not very many. Yeah. They uh, asked over 300 uh, questions, I think something like that. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Um, so are there any tips or, or strategies that you use to ask good questions for people? Well, uh, to me, it's like riding a bike. Um, a lot of people think, well, that's a great idea. I'd like to ask some questions. And so they, they maybe leave and, you know, or, or that conversation, go, oh, I'm just going to ask some questions and they never really do it. So I, I have this little piece of, in, in uh, some of the training that we do in the habits of a multiplying disciple, uh, mm-hmm. where we talk about engaging lost people. And it's like, okay, here, here's a tool. And this tool yeah. is, I want you to develop five questions. So I have this PDF that has 400 questions at the current moment, I keep adding to it. So I just, wow. I just, I collect blogs and people who are big into curiosity and questions. And so I just keep adding to it as I go through here and find five that fit you. Yeah. You know, so not every question, you know, you can't, not everybody can ask every question, you know right. I mean? It's just, you got to find something that fits, you know, so take it into the dressing room, put it on and see if it fits. So take five questions and take four weeks, ask, you know, Make one Monday, two, two Tuesday, three Wednesday, you know, Monday through Friday and, and get the habit of asking that question every Monday. Wow. So just yeah, one, one of those, cool. every month, just ask, that's yeah. all I want you to do. Ask, see what happens. Just see what happens. You know, next day, ask a different question, see what happens, you know? Yeah. And at the end of that four weeks, come back and look at those five questions and say, okay, which ones didn't fit? Yeah. And there's, you know, 395 more to choose from, or there's an internet. There's this thing called the internet that you can go out and <laughs> find all kinds of things. On, you yeah. know? Find, find, find a replacement and, and keep that habit up. Just, you know, every day, just ask a question. Hmm. Um, and, and, and people, you know, I, I, they discover at some point how easy it is to get into spiritual conversations with people yeah, it uh, is. by asking questions. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. and it's not like you're trying to tell them about Jesus, but, you know, I got into a conversation with a, a restaurant owner that I frequent on a regular basis uh, about global warming, you know, by mm-hmm. asking a question. Yeah. And I just, I was able to say to him, I said, you know, my, my views of the earth don't really come from my politics. They come from, from Genesis one, where, mm-hmm. where God is the creator of this universe and gifted me the stewardship of it. Yeah. And so I feel like I'd, I'd ask him about packaging. Mm-hmm. Uh, I sit in this restaurant many mornings during the week and the, the, the loader, the people who bring all the stuff in are there at that time, bringing uh-huh. the stuff in. And I asked him if he, I, I said, you know, do you ever get, um, feel guilty or, uh, about all the packaging, you know, all the stuff that comes in here is packaged in cardboard and plastic yeah. cartons and, and then I watch him carry the waste out, you know, and I said, yeah. you ever, you ever that discomfort you? And he goes, yeah, it does. And so we got into this big, you know, and, and he's, he's, you know, on, in the so, uh, global warming and all this kind of stuff, you yeah. know, and on, and on, and it's like, I don't, you know, that's, I, I don't know about that, but I just know that, that, that I, I believe that God created the universe and, yep. and he gave me stewardship. It says it right there in Genesis one, 
and stuff. And so, you know, you have those opportunities to, to yeah. really just, you know, identify yourself, obviously, as a follower of Jesus, you know, when you're asking questions like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that that Meredith and I use a lot is one of your quotes that you like is to be spiritually obvious and not spiritually obnoxious. Um, mm -hmm. We got that from directly from you. So thank you for that. Um, but it, but that but being obvious, it draws people out and asking yeah. just being curious draws people out. And everybody has a spiritual ache at their longing for for something spiritually. And it's going yeah. to come out when you're curious and it's going to come out yeah. when you're obvious. We don't yeah. have to shove Jesus down people's throats. Um, nope. And nope. It, it's so and we don't also we don't have to just, you know, fake like, hey, I really like you and never talk about Jesus. You know, yeah. <laughs> you just yeah. can be with people naturally and yeah. curious and people can say, yeah. hey, I have this ache and they start to walk towards God. Um, yeah. And so thank you for yeah. showing us that we can be obvious and it draws people out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so full disclosure here, I got that from David Watson. So oh, right. at some point, I don't know where he wrote it or I'm whatever. I'm sure David I, I, Watson I'm, I'm, got it from somebody yeah. else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so he, he had a, a profound influence in my life. So a lot of things I say come from him. So <laughs> oh, that's good. I like it. Um, so the, I just want one or two ways that we can make besides you, you talked about asking questions, changing our mindsets. Are there any other ways that we can make Jesus more accessible to the people around us? You know, I, I think a person's story, you know, is, is so valuable. Yeah. Um, and this is back to listening and asking questions and stuff. So, you know, to know, you know, Joshua and Meredith and not know about, you know, uh, your time in the Middle East mm -hmm. would be like to not know you. Right. You know, I mean, and, and so um, I think, you know, the idea of seeing people, uh, there's a movie I love. Um, and, you know, um, I'm not recommending the movie for some, I don't want to get anybody, you know, angry because <laughs> I recommend a movie that they feel like had some stuff in it that they like, but anyway, um, so it's called Grand Canyon and, uh -huh. um, it's, it's, it's about a, a, a white guy who's really rich and a black guy who's sort of blue collar and they, they meet, um, and on a couple of different occasions because of a car issue, one guy drives a wrecker and one guy has a Lexus or Mercedes or something. And so they become friends and they, they end up at the grand Canyon. And the whole story is about this, this grand Canyon. And, and, um, the kind of the idea is, is that, um, everyone, um, I don't know anybody that's ever been to the grand Canyon that doesn't have this sense of awe. Oh, okay. this yeah. sense of, you know, it's like, oh, <laughs> look at this magnificent hole in the earth, you know, <laughs> this crevice yeah. that's just, yeah, it's just, it's, yeah. and, and the, the metaphor in the movie is, is that every person you meet is like that. Hmm. Um, wow. They don't, they don't connect it to God, but, but we can, you know, yeah. in the, we're creating his image. We're image yeah. bearers. Uh, we're, we're about imaging him, you know? And so I think of, of when I, connect with people I, I long to know their story you know I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to a a, a a club I belong to tonight it's just it's a, a a club of men that we'll meet and and um we'll sit around and and uh, I'll you know I'll pick out a guy and I'll just say I I want to know his story and so I will begin to lean into him and invariably um, in that relationship, uh, it will allow me to make Jesus accessible to him yeah. because there will be some reciprocity at some time. He will, yeah. he will ask a few things about me or, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have an exchange that will take us deeper. Yeah. And so I think, you know, viewing people as a story, you know, not rather than just a set of actions, yep. um, you know, that guy cut me off in traffic. Well, what's the story here? Mm -hmm. You know, what's, yeah, what's the story good. behind this person? Um, I, I think that's really, really important. And, you know, the other, the thought that's, that drives me um, is, is really an answer to the question, what does God want? Yeah. And, and when you look 
at the Bible, um, you, you really can see that God wants a family. Hmm. Um, the, the triune God could have existed for eternity upon eternities. And, and there's, there's, there's oneness, there's fulfillment, there's purity, there's holiness, every, everything's complete there. Yeah. There's nothing needed in the triune God, but, yeah. but they wanted a family to experience the relationship that they had. And so they created humanity. And so mm -hmm. the Bible is a story about God attempting to build that family. And so, you know, you look from Genesis all the way down through revelation, God is, is, is one of things. So when I get in the family, then my main activity is to find those family members that aren't yet connected to the family. Yeah. You know, so that's good. When, when I, realize that that god's looking for his not yet children mm -hmm. um, and and i look around my neighborhood as i look look out my window right now or I, I get in my car and go to the grocery store you know i i'm i'm constantly sort of thinking okay father help me find your children that are not yet wow. connected to you you know and and realizing that he's out there doing that and i just need to find him in that process yeah you know, uh, so it good. just helps me make jesus more accessible to people yeah that's so, so good uh, yeah, there's just a couple of questions I like to ask at the end. One is, uh, if you can give advice to your 21 year old self, what what would you say to your 21 year old self? Well, uh, you know, this is this is a no brainer, but um, I, I wish I would have found uh, more wise people to ask questions of. Hmm. Um, I was so interested in displaying the knowledge that I had acquired yeah. that I probably uh, missed so many opportunities to listen to uh, people around me that had so much more experience than me and just to let them talk. Yeah. Um, I, I knew a little bit of it in my life. Uh, my father was in the air force. Uh, so I grew up as a military dependent mm -hmm. and I remember um, several stations we had where people lived together in the same neighborhoods and they would gather out on, on the carports uh, in lawn chairs. And, and as kids, you know, you could be out playing or, or you could sit there and listen to these uh, military folks tell stories. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I used to love listening to them tell stories. And somehow I lost that, you know, as I gained a little bit of my own knowledge. Mm. So that was something I wish I'd have done. Good. Uh, yeah. And are you, you reading or watching anything that you would recommend? Hmm. I am reading right now, Eric Hoffer's the true believer. Um, it's about mass movements and he was a, a longshoreman a philosopher back in the sixties. And, hmm. and, um, uh, so yeah, it was, that was really, really good. Um, the other one I I've, I've just finished or and it's called turn that ship around. Uh -huh. For anyone that likes to read a, a really fast um, storybook, um, it's about a, a Navy uh, submarine captain. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the best movement leadership books that I've ever seen wow. because he has um, uh, in, in the Navy, their routine is to give a captain a year to learn all the systems on a vessel and to become the subject matter expert of, of every system on the vessel. Wow. So you can answer every question, make every decision that needs to be made. Yeah. And this guy was uh, given a boat, uh, but then uh, because of some emerging things got switched and didn't get his year. He only got six weeks and he was given <laughs> the worst submarine in the Navy to command. <laughs> and, and that process changes his, his entire way of leading uh, from mm. having answers to asking questions. Wow. And it's a fascinating read as you go through that. And he tells the stories of, of how, you know, he came up with stuff and, and develop ways of, of helping people under him lead better. Yeah. And uh, so it's called turn that ship around. Wow. Turn that ship around. All right. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Roy, yeah. thank you so much. It was a pleasure. It was great talking to you. I really enjoyed it. So oh, thanks. man. Thanks, man. I'm so, I'm so glad you're doing this, man. I, I, you know, I, uh, I've got you on, on my list now. So All I'm right. looking forward to your, your future guests. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Have a good one. All right, man. Thanks. Bye.